on the lab. So you know all, that, all this, so then you can just ask me questions. And of course you all read the papers. Yes, that, that I gave you. So, but anyway, I will try to say something about it. Uh, and uh, on Thursday, the, the last lecture we had, we talked about dynamic programming. So you remember what we could do with that? We could find an optimal alignment between two sequences. An optimal in this way meant that we can, given some rules, so given in this case some cost for a gap, some uh, rule for substitution for alignment to, to residues, to uh, uh, letters to each other, there is a, some kind of score. And then, given two sequences, we ha can be guaranteed to find optimal alignment. That gives a number. So, um, of course, the problem with that, there are two things. One is actually that it's actually quite slow. It's, you to calculate the one alignment is not slow, it takes milliseconds or microseconds or whatever. But uh, to do it for this 10, 20, 30 million sequences in the whole database, it takes some time. It's doable, but it takes time. Because you need to calculate the length of the sequence you search against it against the length of the database. So that's in the order of billions of calculations you need to do. And uh, that's one problem. That's actually do something faster. Would be good, but ideally equally good. The other problem is that this number you get out, what does it really mean? Does it really mean that you have uh, uh, maybe a number 55? Is it good or is it bad? Does it matter what sequence you put in there? Is it, is it always good or is it all bad? So that's what we talk about today. We talk about two algorithms, particularly. But maybe it takes more about false day because it's slightly easier to understand, but the idea is similar to BLAST, and BLAST is what people use today, which is much better. Well, uh, so you use BLAST and false day. So that's what you have in, in what you printed out was the BLAST tutorial, actually. And then the second part is the database searching. So how do we do this for searching database? So basically, last lecture was about how to align two sequences. Certainly, it's obvious that you can align one sequence against every sequence database, but when, what does it really mean? What does the score mean? So, as I said, the program takes in something times the length of the two sequences multiplied by each other to calculate. You need to have, you have a matrix here, you need to fill out one number in each matrix, and you have to do some calculations with each number. Some if statement, but this is the order. So if you have a sequence that's twice as long, or data that's it takes twice as long. If both sequences are twice as long, it takes four times as long. So as I said, we need false algorithms, and to do that, we can use what's called heuristic algorithms. So we use <coughs> algorithms that are, that are not guaranteed to find optimal solution. So that's the key. There's no no guarantee that you always find optimal solution. But they are way faster. So we talk about fast A and BLAST. So why do, why do we want to use these heuristic algorithms? Well, often a reasonably good solution in, is, is perhaps all you need. And particularly in this case, if you think about database searching, it's like that most proteins or genes in a database are not related to the one you search for. So most of it is just random sequences comparison. I mean, most of the genes are not related to each other if they take two random genes. So of course, if you can spend the time on the ones that are related or that might be related and ignore the ones that are all that are uh, completely unrelated, you could do it much faster. But then you need to know that first. Uh, so basically, in many cases, it's the only practical solution. So you, ha you can have uh, sometimes you can use biology and knowledge and things like that to, to do specific tasks here. So okay, so let's go back to this alignment. So basically we had these matrices. 
we had these diagonals. So you can think about the alignments often follow these diagonals. So actually, the first thing that people did was make to make these dot plots. And these dot plots, and you can even almost, almost like take them out and look at them, and you can say, ah, oh, do we find any strong diagonals? So if you can only focus on these diagonals that are the ones that have a lot of hits, that are a high lot of dots in a dot plot, that will speed up things. And, and of course, if you only calculate along one diagonal, you do not have to do n times m calculations, you only have to do n or m calculations, so which is much smaller. Particularly if one of these diagonals is a big database and one is a sequence. So you only have to do it, maybe not, not, at least much more to solve. Of course, you cannot just take one diagonal, you need to take several, but at least you can focus on the ones that are important. And more important, I mean, how would you computationally fill out dot matrix? I mean, dot plot. Can you do that faster than you can do um, uh, than they calculate every position in a matrix? And that you actually can do that if you do some pre calculations. So if you take, well, if you go through every, every position in the matrix, you take every matrix. Okay. So you have a matrix here. And you, let's take this A, C, G, C, C, A, T. And you have some sequence here that you want to see where are it, where do I want to fill out things here. So say you have A, T, T, C, A. So of course, you can go through this matrix one position by one position. So I have an A here, and but that's also n times m calculations. So that takes a long time. What I instead can do is like I can make at least here, here are all A's. So now I have A in position one and um, Six. So then I can very quickly as we go through this sequence. I have uh, know that if I have an A here, I put a cross in position one and, six, one and six. All the G's I have in two and three. Then nothing here. T's are only in position seven, so I have to put a cross here. And C's are in positions over there. So I can only have to go through this and basically have to memorize them. Put the hash record of the computer. So like a database, like a, where I do this and look it up in the database. I can do it way much faster. And this is actually the idea of these people, even the more advanced algorithms do, is that they can like memorize where do I have this kind of pattern. So here I know I can make another lookup. I can make all the lists, all paths and all like that, all ATs. So where do I have an AT? I can make the list of all ATs. And I have all an AT there. So then I can have an AT there. I can find if I have another AT over here, I can do I should put a diagonal like that. So I can make a list of all pairs, or triplets, or a combination of pairs and triplets, etc. So that's the key idea. So basically, another way to put it is that basically when you do dynamic programming, you're actually only interested in the, in the area here where you have high scores. The parts that are there, that have low scores, you, do, you, you can... You, I mean, it doesn't matter if, if it's a two or a one here. It's like that's not so important. You spend a lot of time calculating things that are not relevant. You want to calculate the best alignment, not for a lot of bad alignments. And as I said, the most sequences are not related to each other. So in most cases, you will only have these bad alignments. So I will go through. So the, this is the idea of fast day. It is, I think, it's easy to understand the blast, but it's it was probably I remember papers. I think it was actually released more at the same time as Blast One. Yes. I have a uh, question. Um, is it generally like that that we just cross out the the area which is not in the middle? But how can we say that these values aren't that big? No, we, 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 we don't cross out the areas in the middle. No, no, we, we cross out the areas that have low scores. Yeah, but how can so, we so Exactly, this is where we come to. So we will try to find first, localize areas that have low, good scores. They don't have to be in the middle. They can be anywhere. Yeah. So we, we'll, uh, we, we'll 
that's next slide. <laughs> but they don't have a middle. It could be up here, and everything here could be bad, or everything went bad. Um, so the first day was released, I guess, in the early 90s, if I remember correctly, and um, Blast One was released more at the same time. But then it was the, the and, and Blast One was made way faster, but not as, not at all as accurate as Fast Day. But then Blast Two was released in mid 90s, and it was uh, both faster and at least as accurate as Fast Day. So that's that's why people use nowadays. And uh, now there are some variations of it, but basically, so basically the idea is, if you want to find a good scoring alignment, you should have some areas that exactly match here in the middle. So you would like to have, I mean, in the nuclear testing, you have at least a number of uh, uh, areas that are diagonals that are exactly identical. This is different from the fast day and blast, the fast day one with exactly identical sequences or, uh, or matches. Blast looks for also similar sequences. That's one reason why it's better. So basically, if you, if you think about this plot, and as I said, we can actually fill out these kind of exact matches very fast. It's quite easy to do. We can do it like that. Uh, and, and if you don't find one diagonal or like one area like that, we have lots of these matches, or more than you know, others, that is a good place to start searching for your um, uh, uh, dynamic program for, for your alignment, for your optimal alignment. So if you, in this case you will see that there are more here in the middle than if you will go up here. It's not so obvious in this slide. But. So th this is the first step is to find what they call hotspots. So hotspots is a pair of words, so two, two sequences, two pairs of sequences of length of certain lengths exactly match, so identical. So in nucleotides you use a longer length, maybe six, something like that. In protein you can use only two because the two, two nucleotides are the same. So you find these hot spots. So there are a number of these, so even in random sequence you're going to have some parts that are similar. Yes? Do you do this with this hash that you do? Yes. So you can, you can basically calculate it. So you basically this, that this is way faster than to calculate the, uh, go through every spot. I mean, if you go through every spot you would have already done all the work. So you find here, okay, I have an ACGT, you find both have an ACGT, and you find in all this possible. So this, and, and when BLAST, you do the pre-calculation of the database first, so that takes some time, but once it's done, it's much faster. False say actually, you don't do that, you do it on the, on the fly. So, an example. So here you have, uh, you have, you have a query sequence that you have here, and or this two sequence you should match. And then you basically find, uh, or in this case you have a dot matrix over the one. So you, like as I said, you can easily find all the G's that click like that, and here, and here, they're all in the same place. And then you would, so but normally you find like hotspots, like diagonals. So let's say diagonals makes two, you have one here, you have one there, you have one there, one there, maybe that's all. But you can see here already by high, this is probably the best test of alignment. Uh, so anyway, you, you identify these hotspots. So in, in this case, we will, I mean, if you would really do it length one, it would be all of these. But normally, you have for nucleotides, I think you have length six normally. So there would be nothing here. But but in no, normal sequence, you will have some. You score them. So you calculate some score. So how long they are, things like that. So they can be a different length. And locate the 10 best diagonals. So basically you take diagonals like that. So which 10 has the best um, uh, scores? So you ignore gaps at the moment. You just say, okay, which are the 10 best diagonals I have? So the diagonals with the highest score. This is local alignment now. So I ignore how long they are. I just take the best region. So you look at, look, I look at the 10 best positions. And this can be changed, but the default is 10. And then the idea is to try to, try to combine these into some sub alignments. So basically, I mean, you can, yeah, this is just normal. You, have, you calculate some gap penalties, basically. You can do that, you put them together. And, and, but still, so this, this you can actually do with dynamic programming and all that. You can find it. But this, you only search in 10 alignments. You don't have to go through all matrices. It's a very, very small set you search through. Um, uh, 
And then, uh, if I want to look at like that, and then actually what you, if you find your diagonal here, actually what you do is you, you then you go back and calculate no full dynamic programming in this area. So you have a matrix that is not the whole matrix is basically a band around the diagonal here. So this is how we're filling out the matrix up here. Yes, and we do look alignments. We just, just never go outside this area. And this is of course another parameter you can play around with, but it has some default value. So, summary of this. Uh, is that you have, uh, you find all the hotspots, and the hotspot is a word of length k that exactly match your query sequence. Or, I mean, exactly the same. So, this is really, I mean, and, and I think if I remember correctly, the default in proteins is 2, default in uh, Nucleus size is six, I think. So you need to have six steps, but that, but that can be changed. But of course, the, lo the longer match you have, the fewer matches you will find, and the more likely that you actually will miss your uh, good hit. But of course, it will be faster. So then this is a balance. Uh, then you score this. So you get the score. You calculate just the substitution math matrix for the, along these diagonals. Yeah, you can add them together. Uh, and find the 10 best diagonal runs. And then combine all the sub alignments into one alignment and score each of these alignments with the gap penalty and pick up the best, the best score alignment. So you find one place. And then you do dynamic programming in the restricted area. So in some way, this is not so much faster because you really have to do, if you have to do the sequence, sure, this is faster, but you still, have to, you still have to go through every sequence and look at things like that. Of course, what you could do is saying that if this score is very bad, you have too few hotspots, you just ignore the sequence. So that's what also you do. Skip. Uh, so how long time does it take? You think about it. How much faster it is? So normally we have m times n. So basically, okay, I can show this one maybe. So this is o in the parentheses. It's normally a computer, computer science world saying how, how long time does the calculation take? And often when you do this calculation, you don't really care how long time it takes. You actually care how, how is it dependent on the size of the problem. Because in the long run, that's actually much more important. And if it doesn't matter if you take one or hundred calculations for calculating the one, if it grows exponentially by its size. So if you have a linear increase by size, yes, of course, it tries to be a problem, takes as long. If it's quadratic, it, or if you have two trends, so exponential problem, it gets, even for small ends, small numbers, it gets very, very, independently of each calculation very fast, it gets very, very high, very fast. I mean, something can be constant also. So that, that, that's a way of describing it. So step one and two here, so basically finding the best diagonal runs and putting together, is actually only dependent on uh, the length of sequence. You, you, you have a lookup <coughs> table. You can basically just take this table and set here, you find all the A's and you can fill up. So basically just depend on the length of the sequence. You basically have to find every position in the sequence, see what, what that is there, and then you fill out, put the dots in the, in the matrix. So that's of course much n is of course much more than n times m. Particularly if m is a database, that's very big. So it's like uh, so if n m or if n hundred or two hundred is okay, but if it's, even if you do it for a database, it can be ten millions. So then it basically takes hundred calculations compared instead of hundred instead of one billion. Once you have it pre calculated. Uh, so that's fast. The, th the third three is, is, is the fi finding the optimal sub alignment. Uh, that's basically something that's dependent on the number of edges, so basically it's R squared. So basically, how many, it's basically dynamic programming. You can think about it like, like, like the same problem, but, but we only put these things together. And of course, we can put them together in different ways. But you have to find optimal item, but, but you never you can break the diagonal. So that's something that takes, depending on the number of edges, and the number of positions, you get on these hotspots, and if you just 10, but still, it's like, it's, you know, they have 10 by 10 combinations. So it's, 
Of course, a small adapter, because this is 10, this is maybe 100 times 100. Or 200 by 200, so this is a much smaller number. So maybe it takes 1% of the time, but it's still, it's, it's, it's not, um, so maybe it takes one time. So this is 10 by 10, 10 to 4, and this is maybe 10 to 100, so it's, it's say 99% of the time there. And then, uh, this one, of course, depends on the, basically the area of this compared to the rest of the area. So if you say that this is, you have an area of 10, maybe plus minus, and you have a length of 100, so that means you need to do total calculations instead of 10,000. So that's maybe 10%. So in order for a uh, small problem, you find maybe a factor of 10 in impro improvement. So if you look at how it looks like a bit like, so first this is like the first, what you do, step one, you find all the hotspots. So if you already here, we can see somehow what that is, it looks like the good diagonal in the middle. Then you pick the 10 best ones, so basically that's the 10 longest ones you can think of, because these are, can be longer than two, so you find the 10 best diagonals. And basically, that's normally the longest one, but if it's a substitution matrix you use, it doesn't say it has to be the longest one. But And these are, so of course, you find this one here, this one, this one, this one, but also this one here on the side. So you find something that looks like that. And then you try to find it. Uh, combine this in the best possible way. So you, you can go from that to that to that to that, but that's probably not the best score. So the obvious thing is to go from this to this to this to this to this. To this. So you will find something that looks like that. And now you have a diagonal that's basically here. So if you want to find optimal alignment, you basically search in this area around this, in the band around this, like here. And you will find an optimal alignment like that. Okay, not too complicated. So this, as I said, uh, fast day is not that heavily used anymore. I mean, you can still use it in the web server thing like that, but it's, because it's not, it's just maybe in this case factor ten faster or factor hundred faster, but it's not. Uh, that's often not sufficient. So BLAST is based on the same idea. The, it's slightly more complicated if you want to go into detail. Actually, the code is a pain, but it's not. Uh, there are a few key concepts that are important, there are differences that makes it actually much better. So the original one was actually uh, in 1990, but they used ungapped alignments, and that's really not very useful to use ungapped alignments. But it's based on that idea. But there are a few important things. One important thing is that you when you do this search in the begin beginning, you do not only search for identical matrices, identical matches. If you, if you remember these substitution matrices that we used in, uh, uh, we talked about last time, do you remember this? And the PAM and the day of matrix and the blossom matrices. That they had diagonals that were scores around, uh, let me show you. So that's PAM matrix, for instance, that was this. Yeah. So you had, this for every, for every amino acid substitution, you had a score. So for instance, you, you can say that having two tryptophans next to each other, each other is much better than to have a tryptophan, uh, than to have two uh, isolutions, because they are, when the scores are high, higher. And actually having maybe one tryptophan and one uh, tyrosine next to each other, Get score 13 while having two isolutions, you're going to get score 8. So even, even uh, substitutions sometimes are better than the scores of um, uh, identi identities because that's what you observe in evolution. So to limit you to exact matches kind of takes away this information. You also had the blossom matrices that was similar but not identical. No, no. Okay. Um, so <coughs> that's so in BLAST you take this into account so that substitution matrices provide information that you don't have if you have to get in And then you use what's called final state state 
automata. So basically, that's another computation method is that is hashing. But that's not so well. It's important, but it's, uh, it speeds up things basically. Uh, and there is one more thing. As I said before, it is it pre-approves the database. So normally, what you do when you blast is that you actually have a query sequence, your sequence, if you search, which is often quite short, I mean, it's maybe a few hundred, a few thousand amino acids. But the database has often millions of amino acids, long, millions of sequences with so billions of amino acids in it. So what BLAST does is that it pre-processes this database. So basically, it does the same thing here. It has a word lookup. So it has an, something dot make it dot plot, so does. But this is all the pre-process. So if you know if you have ACDT here, you know, you have to go into your database, say ACDT, I found in position 5, 2098, 5,354,000, all the know the list of all, all these are, all the positions. And the next CGT T is found in these positions. So you can quite fast basically go through every step here and you find, you make a dot. So you make a dot plot in your mind. And then there are a few other small tricks that it does. For instance, you can try to extend these matches. So you look if you have well, if you have one match here, but you can have many more matches along it to make it longer together, and you can put them together to try to extend them. And then uh, it does local gap alignment, so basically it does the same thing at the end. That, that's a gap alignment here at the end, where it looks things together. So you have, can have gaps here, so you, you know, these two can actually be joined together. And then you find a little bit the hit best hits. So one thing you can think about is actually it doesn't really care about what is the gene here, what is the protein here, then you have to push the whole database together. But of course, you, you will very well, you will know where the genes are, so you will not have matches that start one gene that stops another one. But, uh, so let's go through it slightly more in detail. And another important factor is actually that the results, the, the statistical, we will talk about it after the break, is that statistics of BLAST is much more, um, it's much more fund well funded, so it's it's it's, um, uh, it's easy to know when a score is good and when a score is not relevant. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so uh, so basically. Proteins that are related are likely to contain at least a sh at least one of several short of this high scoring hits. And then uh, then it f so the first step in BLAST is try to find these and then extend these on both sides to get optimal sequence alignment. So in the first time it has for each amino acid sequence in this case. So you have, okay, maybe have word in three, but you see if you have PQG here. You actually have enough, then you have a threshold. So anything which has a substitution matrix score higher than 13 in this case is similar. So all these combinations here, basically, as long as the protein is conserved there, but the glycine can, and the protein and glycine are conserved, but the number of substitution in the second position can occur. That all give. Uh, significantly high score, all the substitutions, for making a match in your word, I mean, this dot matrix, dot plot. So for every such triplet of, word, triplet of amino acids, or, trip, or six nucleotides, BLAST has uh, a list of similar enough other sequences. So it, it finds more of this kind of Hotspots, or whatever you want to call them, than the fast does, because it does not, not only take the one that is similar. And you see, so the, the, I mean, so it, but it depends on what amino acid you have. They even some that maybe even the similarities, identities are not high enough to get scores. Hmm. So, step one to two here. So, if you find in your query here, you find all the words that are length w that score more than threshold t, then your p word and so forth, basically. So then you have all the list of words you find. 
And then we'll go step two is the same as in false day. You do scanning of the database. So you find here in sequence one, you find these six in here, you find all the hits. But now you have this slightly more sensitive, well, I know so much, yeah, the more sensitive search, it's not necessarily you find more hits, because it depends on the length of the word you use and what cutters you use, but it's more relevant hits. So here, yeah, this is Z. For neighbor words, you have this one, you have LAA. And for LA, you uh, have neighboring words LAD, AAA, etc. So LAA, neighboring words, you find in 157. So you, have, you find hash, a table here of wherever these words are found. So you see that this one here, AAA, AIL, are both found in position 2 because they are neighboring words. So so if you have this query sequence that have AAL or AA, it will get a dot in position two. But only AAL will get it in three, but um, AAL, yeah. Okay, the third step is then to uh, search this, this alignment. Uh, you try to extend the for every hit you find, so every hit here, you try to make it longer on both sides. And you do that without any gaps, you just, you just follow the diagonal, so that's fast and easy. And you do that in both directions, and you do that until the score gets too low. And here, this is something I'm going to talk about later. Here, basically, you have the e value, so that depends on score s. So that's basically a threshold in this case, you can see that. Uh, for it to be significant. In Blossy called high scoring segment pairs, so you can find longer diagonals here that are not any gaps. And the E value here is basically is the probability to find such a pair having score S or higher occurring by only by chance. So if a small E value, so how, how likely can you find in a database of this type this score, so this alignment score value with this number or higher, by chance, if, if everything was random. So that means if this E value is very small, it's very unlikely to find it. So if your E value is 10 to minus 3, that means that you need to search thousands of databases before you find one at random, if everything was random. Or if it was uh, less than, if it's 10 to minus 10, you have to find uh, 10 billion databases before you find it by random. So you, have, you define a cutoff here of what E value will have. And we come back to this, the statistics and then after the break, how you calculate this, how, what it does depend on length and types, etc. So you, you find some cutoff here, and then you stop extending it when you reach this cutoff. So that means that you have a good estimate how, how likely it is that it is by, by chance. Well, this is the formula. I will got the, that in the break. Um, So, well, we can actually look at this formula for a second. We can look here. Uh, so, so this is basically, we will talk more about it. So this is basically how, how, how many high scoring pairs do you find with a score at least S? Yes. So that is it's an E value here that depends on uh, K and lambda as a constant, depends on the models that you have a social matrix, basically. And N and M are length of query and sequences, and S is the score. So it means that the score is exponential, the, the probability to find something is exponentially decreased with the score. So the higher score you have, the smaller number you get. N and M are just the length of sequence. So if you have a longer sequence and a longer database, you have a probability, the, 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 the E value gets higher. So basically, then it's uh, more likely to find it by random. I mean, if you search a small database, of course, it's extremely unlikely to find something in a random match. But if you have a big database, it's bigger. It's, it's, find something, it's bigger. And it's linear actually by the, by the size of the two. And then sometimes you say, you, you took a p value instead, so the probability of finding, and this is finding, this is the number that you expect to find by chance. And this is the, how, how was the probability of finding at least one? So you don't care if you find one or two. And basically, for small numbers, it's identical. One, this is one minus e to the power e. 
So there's a small number, and that's of course if, if you take a small number, there will be this number will be the same. You can really find two is so small. But for big numbers it's different. But this one uh, can of course never go above one. <coughs> but we come back to that in the break. So this is just uh, an example, a small database size and an old machine. Then they have a query of 153 sequences and it's 6,000 sequences. But it was nothing. We have today about millions. And it took 17 seconds. So if you would do this on the database today, it would take at least 17,000 seconds, which is several hours, which is five hours, basically, to search one sequence in the database. And it's not computers a bit fast, but not not so if you just use one computer, it is in quite some hours to do the search database. Fast days is about the factor of um, thirty faster, and uh, this is maybe a factor of one hundred fifty faster in this case. A lot, this is part, and this, this difference is actually increased by when the database is bigger. A lot of time, because when you have small programs, it takes a long time to start things and you know, reading the sequence. This, this thing is small, takes a, it's, a, it's a factor. But this is at least something that's doable. This is certainly, and today, but even today, a blast search against the whole database probably takes five, ten minutes of that. So it's not, at least even a computer, you will, you will try on, or you already, you already tried. So how long time did it take? Well, yeah, maybe that's a small database. We'll try it. We'll see if we have time to try after the break also. So, dynamic, yes, the comparison here, dynamic programming is of course just gold standard. You get sensitive results, but you spend a lot of computing time doing stupidities, calculating scores between proofs are not related to each other. So it takes a long time, but it uses all information about other sequences. And it computes the useless area for computing all from sequences. You'll spend a lot of time computing things that are not relevant. Fast day is less sensitive than dynamic programming blast. It's just partially trying to speed up the comparison. Does not really evaluate the results statistically. Well, that's not really true. It does have to some way, but it's much faster than dynamic programming. And BLAST is the best. So it's sensitive, more sen sensitive than faster. BLAST evaluates the results statistically. So you can make a number good way. It's faster than fast day. And uh, uh, yeah, so actually. One main reason is because it uses the entire database when you know this pre calculation has. So, so basically what I mean here is that BLAST does the disk. It has a database, you create against the database, here you can create with each individual sequence. And then afterwards you can calculate the statistics. But there are some differences in these things. But I, I think FASTA day is very little used nowadays. But the FASTA day format is still used as the standard format of sequences. Okay, so uh, BLAST is not only one program, it's a set of programs, it's actually two different versions of BLAST. It's BLAST 2 from MCBI and from the University of Washington, so there are two different versions uh, going up, but they are more or less identical. They're slightly different output. But there are a number of different ways you can do this, and this is actually quite useful to know. The normal thing when, when, when we think about protein is that we use BLAST P, BLAST for protein. So you compare one amino acid sequence to a database of amino acid sequences. This is basically. For a protein person like me, that's the normal way to do things. For but of course, sometimes you want to search nucleotides, you want to search genomes, and use BLAST M. So do you think it's more sensitive or less sensitive to search uh, in the genome? Or the nucleotide in a protein. So who votes for protein? Who votes for nucleotide? One person votes for nucleotide. And who votes for uh, throwing away all the data and do it uh, by hand? I know what it is. Actually, no, 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 actually, you have much higher sensitivity in when you do a pro protein. Because, really, for finding distantly related things, the nucleotide sequence can change quite fast. And if you really ask with BLAST N, when we know that you don't um, care about the uh, main insertion that changes the protein, the protein sequence, and then also we know that there are more, the third position of the codon. It's less conserved than the beginning, first of because that, that often do not change the amino acid sequence, so that can mutate easier. So normally, when you do, if you do a search on a protein sequence, you have all these things that are conserved longer time in evolution that you see that are, can be lost in the nucleotide sequences. So often, if you, if you really want to find related protein coding genes, it's much better to do it on a protein level. And that's why they have uh, 
for instance, they have Blast X. So they, they take a nucleotide query. So maybe you don't have your protein query, you don't know, that it, but you think it's a protein coding, so you have, it. So you have a nucleotide sequence. And then you translate it in all reading frames. There are six possibilities. So you can do it that way or that way, and you can start at different positions. And then you start the protein sequence anyways. So it is basically, it's basically just with the pre processing, and then you run this, this uh, six times. But it's very useful that you don't have to do it yourself. It's already built in, and of course it's faster because you have a quick way to do it. Uh, and the same thing here, if it's the other way around, you have your protein sequence. Say you want to find somewhere in this genome, but you don't, you, ha you haven't assigned every <coughs> gene in the orphan in this genome because that, that's it's just processed, or, or it's not. You, you suspect there's something missing there. You take a protein sequence, and you only want to find is there a signal of this protein sequence somewhere in this genome? And that was T blast N. That was blast X. And actually, you can do it T blast X. You can do it both ways. You can take two nucleotide sequences. And you translate both. So proteins in six different ways, and then you search them all against each other. And you cannot use it with the MR database because it gets too slow. Because I guess, I guess we need to do 60, 36 different alignments in this case. And you do the dynamics. It's not. No, it takes more time, of course, but it's it's, it's too long. So th th there are times when you actually can think about what you want to do. So there was. A, when you ask the paper I was reading the other day, where people try to find what we call orphan genes, so genes that are not related to anything else, and it should have a number of Drosophila-related genomes, so Drosophila, Melanogaster, and some other newly sequenced. And of course, the problem, as I said at the beginning, is when you have a genome, is that you don't, it's hard to say exactly where the genes are. You can say you stop and start, you don't really know that. But... Uh, so they found some genes that thought this is maybe something that's newly created, that it does only exist in this Drosophila strain, but not in other Drosophilas. But of course, if you only search, if you start searching them with BLAST-P, you say, okay, I thought all other protein coding genes are annotated. But it might be just that it's missed the one and it's not annotated, or it might have been just because one stop code in the middle. So then you need to do some BLAST-N searches or BLAST-X searches also to see if you can find some, some signal from it. Okay, so let's uh, take a, a short coffee break, and then we'll come back to st statistical significance of scores after that. Discuss some statistics. So basically the idea is, uh, fine. when is a hit correct? Or what is it? When, when, is it? When, when do you know if you find a homologous sequence, basically? That's, that's what we're looking for. We're looking, we're looking for Things that are related by homology, basically. And uh, we talk about E values and P values, we mentioned it briefly in the first half, and then we talk about the significance that is related to this. But for some we want to do, do define what is correct. A very common way to measure particular protein similarity is to use identity. So must say that you say that two proteins are 50% identical or 80% uh, or 20% or something like that. And it's, it's, it's intuitively very a very good measure, but it really has a couple of problems. For the first part, it's actually quite length dependent. So really, it depends a bit on how you define identity. Do you find, I mean, if you take two proteins and you have a local alignment, you can have a very high identity in this alignment, but the rest of the proteins are completely unrelated. So you take, you can divide the identity by the length of the shorter proteins or the length of the length. You have to define it a little bit. And particularly, and particularly if you take a short protein, you're going to find something identical by just randomness in the database. I mean, if you take anything up to 10, 11 amino acids, identical sequences exist in complete unrelated proteins just because of the size of the database. And uh, so identity has this problem, but on the other hand it's very uh, useful because it's very, it's very intuitive, it's very easy to calculate, but it's 
it doesn't have the full statistical power. A, a related measure that is, has the same problem and is at least I heard very, very rarely used, but it is similarities. Basically, it's probably a slightly better measure because it basically measure anything where the substitution cost in, in the matrices we have whenever this value is bigger than zero. So that's the whole diagonal and then there's a few things like that. So there you have a few areas where there's a bigger than zero. So probably you have, so this is always a bigger number than that. And this is, it's, I think statistics is slightly better measure because you can better measure things. It's slightly less intuitive in my mind. But normally you have, if you have <coughs> decent long protein, you have, if you have 50% identity, that's basically you have hardly any gaps in the alignments. That's like when you start having few gaps, but not that much. So the alignment is almost trivial. If you have 90% identity, that then is basically the same protein, it's just some point mutations. So often when you do, so you have, if you remember Uniprot, uh, in Uniprot we talked about that, you had the Uniprot uh, reference uh, sets. You had 100%, 90, 50, and maybe, I don't know, uh, yeah, that's maybe it. So you had you make a subset of the pro whole database where you have 100% in space, you take away, you have only one copy of everything which is identical. 90%, if there are two, two or more sequences that are more than 90% identical, you take away all but one. And the 50% the same thing. And, it, and that's, that's uh, is of course, so in this case, the alignment is easy, the identity measures something. You could, you could of course, use an E value, or you could use a um, statistical score instead, but it doesn't really help that much. It really helps the statistical score when you get down to below 30% sequence identity, because there are proteins that are 20% identity and are completely unrelated, and there are identities that are 20% identical and are very, very similar. So often what we talk about, we talk, as I said before, the definition of homology is important. So what is homology? What does it mean? Does it mean that they have high similarity? No, not necessarily. It means that they have one single time that had a common ancestor. So this is a really a yes-no question. Which is of course not, a, not always very easy to answer with the yes or no, but the, it, the, the definition should be like that, yes. Isn't, aren't all proteins in some way homologous? So would the question more be, well, is it... No, I don't think they are. Um, so many generations? Uh, you could somehow define it, but m most, at least, there are probably been proteins that have been involved in non from DNA material that is not coding for protein. If you think that it's just random DNA pieces together, so, and there's another set of random DNA pieces together, and th this could be protein A, this could be protein B. I, I mean, you would not call them homologous, because they really never have been the same thing. Because they, they, they were really coming from not, not protein to protein. Certainly, every nucleotide once was the first nucleotide. And was, but even that is not certain, because it, it might be really that life started in different places at the same time, and there was a mix of things like that. So, but clearly, they are, I mean, they are, and it's discussed how often it happens, and how, uh, but if you go from non, something that's not a protein, that's not, clearly not coding, to something that is actually coding for protein, that should not be related to anything else. That's, and that has, so you, you have at least some thousand of families that you wouldn't say they are related to each other at all. This is, I mean, there are, there are, there are people that have these theories that are subsets of these things that are related to each other. So you have a, a small part of a one protein, and uh, we duplicate many things, but that's that's really not the whole protein in that case. And then you really talk about subsets, and that's I mean, these are we find some statistical significance, but it's hard to really understand what it means. What what is really converted? What is, what is really more homogeneous in this case? So I, I wouldn't say that all proteins are related to all proteins. That's Do we limit ourselves to a specific point? Uh, in time, for example, we could have protein A up here, uh, and then we have some mutation. We get B and C. Uh, over time, C changes functionality yeah. due to mutations in the, for example, active site, mm -hmm. it's an enzyme or whatever. And then we have uh, a division, uh, yeah. uh, mutation division here. And then I would say that these two are homologous because they share. The B, yeah. but I wouldn't say that they are homologous with I mean, I think this one. I mean, the def definition would, 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 if it really is like that, the definition would be all, would all be homologous. All had all share a common ancestor. Yeah, but 
but, 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 but the, the, uh, so really in this case, if you have to have mutations, point mutations, small gaps, they're they all homologous. Problems occur if they maybe fuse with another gene, or maybe one of them becomes a cell gene, so it's not expressed for a long time, and then it starts to have mutations and rearrangements. Then, then you, I mean, you have things that are circular rearrangements, things that are like uh, the power first part, of the number, but then you can start discussing what is really homologous. But in this case, when you say the gene basically saying they have mutation, the active site disappears in one case, and the case of another, I would call them, that would be homologous. So when we come back a bit more, so that, that, that's come back a bit more today, we talk about phylogeny on, I think, Wednesday. But, it, but it's, that's, that's the real, the real definition is common ancestor, and common ancestor, I would say, are really not fusion with too many of these. I mean, fusion is a problem, and then it's quite common. So that's really, how, how do you find it? And that's not, I don't, people have different views, so it's not an obvious answer. So basically, but they, and of course, in many cases, the problem is really not, not defining homology. The problem is to find them. The two products are very old. I mean, they had a common ancestor a long time ago. I mean, at least they, they can be homologous, but they are, it's very, very hard to find it. So in, for a long time, you have to find, you, in many cases, you realize it only when you had the structures. You saw the structures are very similar, and you realize, wow, this must be homologous. And then you can actually, then you can realize it, because active sites for or something like that. But before you had it, it was difficult. Nowadays, it's the secret search method better, so you can do it better. But it's um, uh, not, yeah, anyway. So the problem is not often to find that they are not, that they are similar, but not homologous, the problem is often to find that they are homologous, because I mean, they are just, evolution has passed too many generations, so you can't see it. So that's a common problem. So really, this is actually what we want to find. Of course, the idea is that of course, if, if they're homologous, that they have the same function. That's not. There are cases when they're not. There are cases. I think there's an eye protein that you have that is actually very, very related to some enzyme that's 96 percent identical. So they're basically the same. So that is a point mutation that takes away the active sites. So that sounds like completely different. They have completely different functions, but they are of course very homologous. So, so they may, it doesn't. Be, but of course, in average, of course, homologous proteins are more similar to each other than others. And then do the same uh, similar, similar functions, etc. But there are always exceptions. So we basically want to find homology. This is the idea. We want to find things that are related. And these measures, are, although they are very intuitive, they are statistically not the best way to do it. So basically, we have, of course, we have a score. We could just take a score, a number. And maybe this is generic programming, we've got a score of some number that means something. So that they have a sum of substitution and gap analysis. The problem is that it's very hard to interpret it. It's very hard. what does it really mean? I mean it's a very good measure somehow. I mean it's really that's what we that's what we're trying to optimize, that's what we're trying to find. But it doesn't really mean uh, anything. And if you do that, you would <coughs> I mean, probably get for produce you you will get if we have like random sequences pieces out here in line methods, so you will get a normal Gaussian distribution, you will get scores that looks a bit like that. However, what we do in every case, we're not taking random alignments like that here, here. We in every for every pair of sequence genes, we always try to find the best alignment. So that means that the scores we find are not distributed like this. The a First, we, if I look at alignment, uh, global alignment statistics is much harder, so that's, we can, that's basically impossible. There are people who do it, but it's very hard. But if you look at alignment, you can do it. So basically, you, get, you look at alignment, you can never have a score lower than zero. So even, even to random sequence, you're going to find some part that matters a little bit here. So, so you're going to have actually what's called extreme value distribution. So it's something that's going to look like that much more. It's going to be like almost like a square of this one somehow. You take away all the low numbers that you make. Well, it's not a square, but, it's, but, it, but it, has an, so it has a long, long tail of the high scores, even for random sequences, but it has nothing below zero. So you take the best score for every, every sequence. So it looks like that. So this is the normal Gaussian distribution, and this is extreme value distribution from some example. So the optimal local alignment score and the number of paths here. So this is random, this is how it will look like in, in the random database. So first, what you want to do is like ask the questions out here in the, in the high scores. How likely is it that this occurs by random? If you have this, you can have to do normal t-test, something like that. But that's not what you have. So the question you have here is this: uh, How if I have a score of 59? 
how can I do that? And as we said before, this is basically the way that the formula, I mean, you do this analytically for ungapped alignment. Do for gapped alignment, it gets much harder, but if the, if the gaps tend hard enough, you basically have to do the same thing. You had to optimize these parameters, k and lambda, for um, gapped alignment. You can't, you can't calculate them, but for ungapped alignment, you can actually prove this. So you have a p-value, so the probability that, that a random alignment obtains a score higher than x, or it might equal to x or higher. So the probability that the score is equal or higher to x, so this is alignment score in a normal dynamic program alignment score, is some, some constant times the length of the two sequences, one can be the database, times e to the power of minus lambda and constant and then the score. So, so basically, in the exponentially, the higher score is exponentially less likely to obtain. So if you have a score of, so it gets very hard, very unlikely that you will get, by a random sequence database, a score that is higher than something, that's some low number here, an x. Uh, so this is dependent, k, or you calibrate the database composition, so if you have a uh, lot of, uh, so the, 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 this is how factors are calculated, and then this can be the matrix being used. So if you have a blossom matrix, you have another number of lambda than a pair matrix. There is a condition here, I think, that you have to have a matrix which is has an average less than zero, but that's not, nothing. So this is a p-value. So the probability that the random alignment obtains a score equal to be equal to x. Often we calculate the e-value instead. That is the actually the. Uh, uh, right, this is, this, is, uh, <coughs> uh, this is an expected number of hits given when you start the date with a particular size. For small numbers, p values and e values are identical. For high numbers, are not, but that doesn't really matter. So basically, how, how many uh, hits would you get here from starting the database? So if you have a p value of 10 to minus 3, so 0 0.001. That means that if you take 1,000 random sequences, one will have this score. That means, of course, if you search a genome with 10,000 sequences, and you should just cut off of 10 to minus 3, 10,000, you will have 10 of these for you just match something by random. So this is so this, the thing about it. So even one hit by 10, uh, in 1,000 is very unlikely, but if you do it 10,000 times, it's going to happen. So often, good hits have values of 10 to minus 100, or things like that. Um, so here, the formula again. E, e, so e value and p value are basically, where p value is 1 minus e to the e value. And so the, the small value is the same thing. The lower e value, the better you are. So that, um, for values less than 10 to minus 4, e value is basically the same p value. And it's somehow easier to compare e values. As I said, remember one thing here, this depends on the database, n in the, oh no, I changed the left here, so n is instead of n, n is uh, the database size. So if n becomes bigger, some hits can actually be, I mean, some hits are sort of significant for a small database, this, the alignment score is going to be the same, but actually the that alignment score is not going to be significant in the big database. So this is my example here, you search for p31383, I guess the hit, I don't know what it is, but well, you, you can understand what it is, because you have a, it's actually the first hit has an e-value of 0, and a score of 1170, so this is a, for most likely the same protein, and it is called 2AAA yeast protein phosphatase p 2 a so you're basically, this is most likely, at least extremely similar to the protein search, which is extremely e-value of 10 to minus, well, less than 10 to minus 99. But then, if you look here, for instance, you have uh, <coughs> a score here of 40 and 38. So you have p-values of 0 0.001 and 005. That's 10 minus 3. Not that bad. So this is 1 in 1,000 probably to get this wrong. And this is 5 in 1,000. So it's not that bad, p-values. Uh, and these red ones here, it drops down here to have a p-value of 
that's 1 of 40. This is 0 0.091. Since it only means in 1 in 10 almost, probably to get it wrong, which means that you would probably not trust it. But I know this one has a related other protein from another. Uh, so this one has some S381, but it's from another organism, another yeast strain, I guess. Schizosaccharomyces, or something, Schizosaccharomyces. Actually, that one has some related one, which has score 50, which is slightly, that is still probably significant. So, this one hit the small database, would actually have found it, thought it was significant, but in this case, you would not think about it. The protein kinase, so it's, well, it's probably related, but not very similar. And this is kinase, and also phosphatase. So, here, so this is that typical types of output you get with blood. Uh, I thought we should try to do some searches that you would, oh, well, that you already done in your lab, but um, in case you don't remember. But there's a few things that we should discuss first. One thing is actually what's called low complexity regions. So there are, of course, the biology has always practical problems. It's like everything is nice in computers, but for most instance, there, there is a, a lot of proteins and DNA strains that have very repetitive sequences. Basically looks the same. I mean, so you have uh, transposons, so you have all regions, you have uh, coiled coiled regions that basically look the same amino acids. And, all and, and these actually screw up the statistics completely, because basically if you have something that's in the roughest similar that, you get very high scores. So they, they, they provide high scoring for positives. And they are probably from oligos, because they're probably asked more, I mean, at least not the type of hole you won't find it. Uh, and because uh, they have visa, and uh, so you want to get rid of it. So basically, in particular in DNA, but it also produces. So you have regions like this, 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 this here. And there's something here. So this is J, G, this is, uh, and of course this is like kind of very similar, but they're not really any evidence that these homologous just have repeat repeated itself in the same time. So that microcycle is. And, Actually, in the human genome, more than half the genome is basically disrepetitive, and in plants, and uh, it can be even much, much, much higher. And so this, this is a uh, what? Well, this is how the genomes look like. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you search for these things, you will have you've had a lot of hits there, even for things that maybe actually much something else. Uh, so you often what you just do is you, you have some problem you run the masks, this R just puts X's on top of it so they ignore these regions. But that also is sometimes clear proteins that actually can create problems because you can mask out relevant regions also. Sometimes membrane regions, for instance, are masked out with this program because membrane regions are a bit low complexity, they don't have that much variation because they're all hydrophobic amino acids there. That good and I'll talk about you in a week or so. But anyway, that's uh, um, Okay, uh, that's something that we have to deal with. We should uh, remember that database search is a prediction. And basically the prediction is, is it or is it not homologous to query? It is normal. So basically you go, you, you, you go through a database, you put your sequence there. I mean, you get done it both on the computer, your own computer, or in a web browser. Often if you don't do it all the time, you do it in a web browser, but if you want to do it for many sequences, you do it on your own computer. And you, in this case, you have a graph to play in alignment, you get other things here. So they, they basically, by the fourth blast, it places this to complex genome with X. You, look, look, you see, let's look at that in the sequence. <coughs> okay, and then uh, everybody's favorite mistake, last slide before we go to the example, is basically that you say, okay, sequence A matches sequence 1, sequence 2 matches sequence 1, and sequence 3 matches sequence 1. Then two and three should be related to each other, but actually they might be related to different parts of the sequence. So as I said, gene fusion is common, but that's something that we have to look at the regions that match it. So that that's uh, why we we, we talk about later. We don't we don't often do domain searches or search in domain databases is much more useful in many cases. So let's uh, uh, try to die blast. What if I get yeah. 
Så det är när det ser ut som jobbar så vill ta med lite like delta blast som jobbar här på det. Så det det är probably the most used blast page. So that's the uh, so you, you can see you can search nuclear blast, so blast n, blast p, proton blast, blast x, t plus x, plus blast x. So these are the algorithms that we I talked about before. Uh, and there's some bla blast uh, mega blast. So there's, there's a newer version of this also. There are say the special version here we can do primary blast and trace or uh, Conserve domains you can search for, conserve domain architectures, gene expression profiles, etc. 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 Multiple alignment tools, oh, so you can do more things here. And uh, you can search specific databases here, you can search specific human and mouse databases. There's a new version called Delta Blast, which I can try to describe in, in a day or two. Maybe, actually, maybe tomorrow, if I have time. And there's here something called Side blast and fire blast, and particularly side blast, we'll talk about tomorrow. So, but let's go to proton blast and do blast of proton. Now, now we need to find a sequence also. And the body has some favorite sequence. Should take my globe in there? There's many. Let's take some. S6 subunits? Is it right to say? S6 subunits? No, S6. S6. Right, so S6 Well, let's take, let's take, let's take a part of it. Fun. And we click, click there, and then we can search. Like we want to search the whole non-redundant database, but we just want to search to speed up things. We want to search Uniplot, for instance, the Swiss bot part of it. So that's maybe just one million sequences. And then we go over here and click uh, search. Good. Blast. Uh, So you see, this will take, so this is only one million sequences, so it's a small database, but it is probably takes less than a minute to, to do it. Yeah, so we are done. So you get here, you see that the, in this case I find one, two, three, four, <coughs> five very good hits, and then the two that are slightly good, so there's a different color of alignment scores actually. So this is more than 200, this is between 8 and 200, etc. And you see that the lower scores are often shorter, so this is just a graphical display of the hits. How long, how long are the regions, etc. Uh, you can look over here at the table. I'll make it a bit smaller. Uh, so you see the first protein is, is, is basically 100% identical. The first five are basically the same. So these are all the ribosomal proteins, S, kinase, beta. I guess the different organism. And then they start getting another fifty percent of the entity. And then you if you get into but here you see the E values are still ten to minus thirteen, twelve here. So let's take something here, click on something here. This is some, some chicken or some some well, I don't know. I don't have the uh, So this is the uh, uh, those mouse, those human. What happened to my gallus? There, there. So here, here you see I have a line alignment which doesn't really cover that much. You only cover this region here. If compared to the alignment I have to mouse up here, this is a mouse I think. 
so it's a few months ago. Uh, this is mouse. You see, here I, have some, here I have some gaps in alignment over here and here. But uh, I have most of it, it covers the whole thing. But if it was down to my gallus down here, wherever I had it. Yeah, it, it starts in position 73, while Sedona, the first 70 rescues are not aligned. Therefore, it probably continues later. But you, you can also see here that you have a number of uh, uh, identities. So, like, mm, in this region, fifth, more, than, more than half the residues are identical. And you have a number of similarities, so positive to go here, so that's 73%, so it's always a bit higher. Uh, no gaps in this region. Uh, and you have E value 10 to minus 12. If you get back to something which is even lower E value, I don't know. We probably should go up. So how far shall we see here? Well, let's see the last one. It's not that different, you see here. It also starts with position 91, so it's a bit shorter. So it misses 20 rest is more. This, uh, this query is actually b starts at 190, so it's really something extra in this one. It's linked to some. It's actually not the subunit of the, it's a beta DNA receptor kinase. So it's probably in this co completely different protein. I mean, the kinase probably is the kinase part, is probably similar. You see, the identity is still 50%, 48%. There's a small gap here, so, but it's only a three less gap, a short gap. You find here, it's something which, are, which certainly doesn't do the same biological function. So, and But E value is still. Well, it's zero, zero, 003, so this is it's three, a chance to get this hit in is three in a thousand. So, the he so it's cl clearly probably are some homology between the beta and the receptor kinases. I find several of these here. I find it. And the Essex ribosome subunit. Right, something here in between. Here you have an example, which is uh, another kinase, serine screening protein kinase from uh, human. Also, uh, has actually a longer alignment, so it's actually uh, 65 residues. And third identity, identity, so a 58% similarity. E value of 10 to minus 3, basically, or 9 times 10 to minus 4. And I mean, see, the alignment looks quite good. It's like this small gap here, a small gap here, and then we're identical. But this is also a protein that clearly does something else. It's not a kinase. The queer protein was also kinase. So, so this kinase part is probably the main preserved, but the rest is not. So, what would happen if we had used full length sequence? Would, 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 would we have got different answers? Let's try. It takes slightly longer, but not so much longer. So what, what, what would happen to statistics? A longer sequence, will you will have, actually we need a higher score to get the similarity, to get the same E value. So, so, so maybe some of these so-called false hits disappear. So now you have a longer, you see the more, more red thing, the more average score higher than 200, because the scores are higher. So red was the score of 200. You see also one thing, of course, the other one we have basically only gaps in the end term, but not the C term, but here are gaps in both, <coughs> both areas. And, uh, well, E values of these are even lower, it's zero basically, 100 minus 123. Then this is here, this is also the same protein basically. But, yeah, the, but then the dentists is basically are quite similar, but the E values are much lower now, which is long, it's a longer sequence. But they have 50% identity. So we find this gallus, for instance. This one now has an E value of, I don't remember, was this gallus, was the next one maybe? Maybe it was this one, I don't know. Ah, this is 6% then 
Similarity, I guess, for the different identity, even your tenth minus so hundred. We see this alignment here. It's basically uh, this is chicken. Yeah. So you see, well, it looks very good. It may have a few gaps here and there. It basically, more or less every ha- second residue is identical. There's some parts are less conserved here. Some parts are more conserved region here. This is a gap. Few gaps here and there, but not very many gaps. And clearly, basic cover. I mean, so there's something happening. They don't start position one, so the, the end is a bit more variable. It doesn't mean that they're not similar, but the alignment doesn't find them. But let's go back to the ones that were. Off the top, and let's see if I. So let's find the first kinase, for instance. Not the old kinase, but by the way. Uh, but here you have this, you still have this, you see this uh, other, uh, it was a beta, or sort of something, beta, and beta lactamase. Uh, this was semi protein down here, yes. See, including kinase, for instance, this one. See, the even is extremely good still. If you look at this alignment. You see, it's basically, I mean, it has something, they don't start at the same time, position is, it's really a 60 residues longer one in, the, in this uh, serial and serial protein case, okay, so there's some extra parts that are not part of it. But otherwise the alignment is very good, you see there are hardly any gaps, there's a small gap there, small gap there, so there are hardly any gaps, there are lots of similarities. The e values of one extremely good, it was 10 to minus 100 almost, so, so this means we around 10 to 100, Search it before you get one hit this score by random. Identity is 40% and similarity uh, is 62%. So this is, and that was maybe even the last one I had. Well, no more if you keep searching, okay. Well, they don't list, even the last one, the list here. Yes, somewhere here it looks very good. I mean, even it's completely long. So that's the truth. I mean, if you have a long sequence, you find more reliable heat, you can more trust it. If you have a part of it, of course, that is, it makes it a bit harder. Okay, so you think you understand blast and fasting? So today you have time to catch up with your labs and your reading, and of course, the milk goes away. So you will have no lab. Your presentations, how in depth should it be on the theory? In the presentations? Yeah, the oral presentations. Yeah, oral presentations. They don't... I would say that they don't have to be... 